First Chronicles. First Chronicles chapter 28. Reading from verse number 1. The Bible tells us there, Now David assembled at Jerusalem all the elders of Israel, the officers of the tribe and the captain of the division who served the king, the captain over thousands and captains over hundreds, and the stewards over all the substance and possessions of the king and of his sons, with the officials and the valiant men and all the mighty men of valor. Then David, then King David rose to his feet and said, Hear me, my brethren and my people. I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of God of the Lord and for the footstool of our God. And I made preparation for, uh, to, build it, to build it. But God said to me, You shall not build a house for my name because you have been a man of war and has shed blood. Now he said to me, it is your son, Solomon, who shall build my house and my courts. For I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. Then David said, gave, gave his son, and David gave his son Solomon the plans of the vestibules, its house, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat. And the plans of all that he had, uh, and, and the plan for all that he had by the Spirit of the court of the house of the Lord, of all the chambers all around, of the tre treasuries of the house of God, and of the treasuries of the dedicated thing. He gave gold by weight for things of gold, for all articles used in every kind of service, also silver for articles of silver, for, art for all articles of silver by weight, for all articles used in every kind of service. May the Lord bless the reading of his words in Jesus' name. Amen. Now, from this passage of scripture, I want you to begin to pay attention to certain things that I, want to, that I want us to see from that verse of scripture. The first thing I want you to see is the David's sincere desire and aspiration to build the house of God. In other words, David had it in mind. His intention that he wanted to build something for God. Bible tells us that he said, I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the stool of our God. So David had a sincere desire, a sincere aspiration to build the house for the almighty God. Number two thing I want you to notice is that David's diligent preparation for the building of the house is not just the desire to build it. It's just an aspiration to have a place of worship for the Lord. David diligently prepared for that particular building. Bible tells us in that same verse number two of uh, of uh, Second uh, First Chronicles twenty eight, he said, and he had and had made. He said, I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord and for the footstool of our God, and had made preparations to build it. In other words, he wasn't just thinking about it; he wasn't just looking at the whole idea that this is a good idea. He actually made plans and he prepared for the building of the temple of the Almighty God. Number three. We saw God, you know, as much as David wanted to do what God wanted to do, what David was interested in building the house of the Almighty God. God had a different plan. Okay? It's just like when you are building, when you have a contract that you are bidding for, and you think that you are the one who is going to win the contract, and God said, no, I have somebody else. I have a better contractor in mind. The Bible tells us that God had a view of David's desire. God had, a, you know, his own view of David's prepare, of uh, David's desire to build a house. Bible tells us in verse number three, God says, well, I like the whole idea. You want to build me a house. But in verse number three, God said to me, you shall not build a house for my name because why? You have been a man of war and you have shed blood. As much as I like your idea, as much as I want you to be the one to build for me, I don't want you because of the things that you have done in the past. Because you, have, you are a man of war and you have shed blood. In other words, as much as David's desire and aspiration was to build the Lord, as far as God was concerned, David is not the person. It is a good idea. It's an idea that I like. It's one thing I want to see accomplished, but you are not the guy who's going to do it. Number four, I want you to notice, God had an ideal candidate at the back of his mind. As much as he said, David, yeah, I like what you're doing, but you are not going to do it. I have somebody that I've already prepared. God has a choice candidate for whatever he has intention of doing. Whatever wants to, needs to be accomplished, God had a, his choice candidate that he had. And so if you look at verse number six, the Bible tells us, And now he said to me, it is your son who will build my house and my court, and I have chosen, for I have chosen him to be my son, and I will be his father. 
So David wanted to do something. David's aspiration was to do something. But God said, no, somebody else is who the person that I've given the job to. And then finally, from the passage of scripture that we read, I want you to now see David's response to the desires of the Almighty God. You want to see David's response to the candidate that God has, choose, has chosen. The Bible tells us that David not only responded, but David embraced the choice that God had made. David did not go to a corner and say, God, why are you doing this to me? I have prepared. I have put gold aside. I have done all this thing. And now you are choosing my son? What kind of injustice is that? We need to protest in Jerusalem. We need to rebel against God. We have to be able to sue and commit, you know, and come and pray, take this thing before the Supreme Court. How can God, God be so unjust? There's a lot of discrimination going on. You don't like old people? What's wrong with you? Those are the kind of questions that you could have been asking if it were in the 21st century. But the Bible says that David embraced the choice of the Almighty God. Okay? If you look at that verse of the scripture, the Bible makes us to understand that David embraced, uh, you know, the fact that God told David he wasn't going to be building, if you go to verse number 11, look at this response of David there. The Bible tells us in verse number 11, the Bible tells us, then David gave his son Solomon the plans for the vegetables, its house, its houses, its treasuries, its upper chambers, its inner chambers, and the place of the mercy seat. In other words, David had received the revelation of how the temple was going to look like. He had drawn a plan. He had everything organized, ready to start building. All he wanted was a go-ahead from the Almighty God. And God said, no, you are not doing it. Somebody else is doing it. David did not sit in the corner and started weeping and started sucking and started, you know, you know, feeling sorry for himself. But he took that plan and he gave it to his son. You are the person that God has commissioned to build this thing. You are the person given the responsibility to do this. This is my aspiration. This is my desire. But you are the one who has been given that responsibility. And the Bible says he gave his son the plans that he had made. And if you read that part, chapter very well, there were these plans were given to David through the inspiration of the Almighty God. It was given to him through the spirit of the Almighty God. Okay? So what did Solomon do when he got the plan? What did Solomon do with the plan? If you fast forward to 2 Chronicles, 2 Chronicles chapter 5, if you start reading from verse number 1, the Bible says, so, so all the work that Solomon had done for the house of the Lord was finished. In other words, Solomon built the house, just like God has instructed. God had built, you know, Solomon had built it, and Solomon brought all the things which his father David had dedicated that means when David was planning to build the temple, he was already putting aside the things that he was going to put in that temple. He was already taking aside all the gold, all the necessary things that will make the temple befitting of the Almighty God. David was already dedicating it. And the Bible now told us that when Solomon finished building the house, he took all, he brought, all, he brought in the things which his father had dedicated, the silver and the gold and all the furnishings, and he put them in the treasury of the house of God. So you see, there was a collaboration. Although David did not live to see the actual, the physical temple of the Lord being built, David's dreams and aspiration for the Lord's house was realized through his son. Okay? David, although David was dead and gone, David was fully involved in the building of that particular temple. The fact that he was not the one that was given the responsibility to do it. But the Bible makes us to understand that he was fully involved in the building of that temple. And you will ask the question, the guy is dead before the temple was started. How can he be fully involved? David was involved number one. Because it was David's desire for the temple in the place where he was the one that started the whole thing with an idea in his back of his mind. He started the whole temple by desiring it, by aspiring for it. Okay? Bible says, I had it in my heart to build a house of rest for the ark of the covenant of the Lord. So David was involved because he was the one that started. He was the one that initiated the project. Number two, David was involved in the building of the house of God because David envisioned the temple before it was ever built. David had a picture of what that temple was going to look like even before it was built. David saw it. David drew the plan of the temple even before it became physical. The Bible said that David, David, gave, his son, uh, David gave his son Solomon the plan of the visitables, the, of his houses, his treasuries, his upper chambers, his inner chamber, and the place of the mercy seat. You cannot give a plan if you have not thought about it. 
if you have not envisioned it, if you have not pictured it in your mind. So David had a good picture of what the temple will look like. That was how David participated. Number three, David also participated, was involved in the building of the, of the, of the house of God because David prepared and supported the building of that temple. How do you say he prepared for it? The Bible said that he had already started putting things aside. He started putting the gold aside. He started putting the silver aside. All the materials that are going to be put in each of the rooms or each of the areas of the temple, David started gathering it. And when the temple was done, Solomon did have to start running all over Israel to look for those items because they were already prepared for him. Okay? David prepared for the, you know, David prepared and supported the temple by gathering the material and the resources for the building and the furnishing of the temple. So that David made, so that when David made the all materials available to Solomon when the time was needed. That is a very, you know, that gives you a picture that when you aspire for something, when you desire something, sometimes you might not be the one, you might not be the one to accomplish it. But the fact that you cooperate with the process is what this particular, te- uh, this particular uh, story is making us to understand. Now the question that comes to mind anytime you hear me going through this kind of tirade is this. Why am I telling you this story? Eh? Why am I telling you this story? Why is the, what is the importance of this particular story? Why is this necessary for you to understand the story, the, the, the real story behind this story that we're talking about? Why is this story important? My brothers and sisters, the story is important because it underscores the power of the human desire and the human aspiration. The desire and the aspiration of David was made to, was brought to physical realization even when David was not there. His son made it happen. So this story underscores the power of your desire and your aspiration. This story illustrates that when there is a strong desire and a genuine aspiration to do and to achieve something, it has a contagious effect on people, and before you know it, it becomes a reality. The power of aspiration, that's what the story is telling us. That you desire something, and you desire so much that you prepare for it. You desire so much that you begin to put things in place. You begin to put plans in place. When people hear it, they run with those kind of things. When that particular aspiration is strong enough and big enough. So that's the first thing I want you to see from this story. The second thing is that this story is important because it shows us that that power of aspiration has a way of motivating and inspiring unlimited faith. When you see a possible future, when you are able to cast a possible future, what it does is that it motivates people into action. It it inspires people to believe for that which is impossible. Solomon Solomon spent a number of years gathering the material to be because he knew that was the desire of the heart of his father. So when you're, you know, this story tells us the power of aspiration to motivate and to inspire unlimited faith. That's why I'm telling you the story. That's why I told you the story. I told you the story because the story shows us the power of aspiration to focus and to dedicate resources. When you know what you want to achieve, when you know the direction that you want to go, it has a way to focus your attention. You don't get distracted in different, different ways. It has a way of you to dedicate your resources. You don't waste your energy. You don't waste your resources. You don't waste all the things that God has given to you because you know you are dedicating it onto something. When you have that particular goal that you want to accomplish, it has a way of focusing and dedicating your resources. Ask the younger ones. If they have a desire that they want something for Christmas and they buy that their father saying, I'm not buying this thing, you have to save money for it. What happened? They have a way of saving their money. Even when other things are trying to collect that money from them, their attention is focused on that thing that they want and it has a way of dedicating their resources so that when the time arrives, when they have enough money, they can go and get it. That's what happens when there is an aspiration. In the heart of an individual. It focuses your attention. It dedicates your resources. Not only that. This story is important. Because it shows us the power of aspiration. To produce a desired future. If you desire that thing. If you look for that, if you, if you aspire to something and you are dedicated enough and you focus your resource, uh, your resource enough and you are inspired enough, you will find that as you continue without failing, as you continue without being discouraged, one day it will look as if you are in magic land. You will wake up and you will see the result and people will say, oh, he's lucky. No, he had a goal. 
That individual had an aspiration. They were walking towards something and they were not willing to give up. And that was why they were able to get to where they are getting. This story tells us, though David had the desire to build a temple, though God told him he wasn't going to do it, but because he was prepared, because he had inspired his son, because he had gathered the resources, because he had focused his attention, one day, one day, a temple was sitting in Jerusalem. Not because it came there by accident, not because Solomon wished it, but because we walked for it. They did the necessary work. So this story is telling us that when you have aspiration, it produces the result, it produces the future that you are looking for. Okay? And that is why David, the psalmist, who understands very well the power of godly desires and aspiration. He said in Psalm 37 verse 4, he said, delight yourself in the Lord and he shall give you the desires of your heart. He said, commit your way, you commit your way to the Lord, trust in him and he shall bring it to pass. They say there needs to be an aspiration. There needs to be a burning desire in your spirit. There needs to be something that you are gunning for. Something that you are trusting the Lord for. He said, once you do that, once you delight yourself in the Lord, knowing that God can provide it, he said, then that desire of your heart will come to pass. In other words, to move forward in life, to live a life that is beyond limits, that is set by man, set by family, set by the Satan, to live a life that God has in store for you, you need the power of aspiration. You need that hunger in your spirit to be able to attain to the height that God is taking you. Because he said, I know the thought that I think towards you. They are the thought of evil and they are thought of good and not of evil to give you an expected end. There is a desperation, there is a place God is taking you. There has to be a hunger in your spirit to get there. Because if you are not hungry for it, you will see it, but you may not possess it. So to access all that God has in store for us, we need the power of aspiration to see and to attain that particular height that God is showing you. That's why God said to Abraham, He said, Look to the right, to the left, to the east, to the west. All the land that you can see, say, I will give it to you. He's putting him a hunger in his spirit. He's trying to tell you, run for something. Fight for something. Hunger for something. Because when that hunger is there, it motivates you to move forward. So if you are going to live a life beyond limits, aspiration must be there. And that is why in our teaching series throughout this month, we have been talking about living beyond the limits. Okay? And in our first installment, we talked about uh, going beyond the limits by living our lives uh, in this, you know, go, that we said that going beyond the limit means for us to live our life beyond the obvious limitations that people put in our ways. There are limitations that will come your way. Limitations of finances, limitations of relationship, limitations of education, limitations of, you know, every, there's all sorts of limitations. He said, going beyond the limit means that we are living our life despite the obvious limitations that we face. I remember saying that to live our life beyond limit, um, we must be able to break free from any imposition, any imposed limitation that the enemy has put upon our life. You are not educated enough. You are not smart enough. You are not good looking enough. You are not connected enough. Whatever the reason that the enemy brings our way, when you live beyond those living, you are living a, you are living a life that is beyond limits. It means breaking the mental imprisonment that the enemy has placed around us. Where we are told that yes, because you speak in a certain way or you look in a certain way, you cannot achieve X, Y, and Z. Those are mental limitations. Living beyond the limit means you break free from those mental limitations. Living beyond limits is to live beyond the artificial boundaries that the enemy and the society has set over our life. And finally, living beyond limits is to live a life the way God intended it. Because it says that I know the thought that I think towards you. There is a plan. There is a place where he's taking you. When you want to live beyond the limit, you must be able to see where God is taking you and live in the reality of where God is taking you. Living beyond the limit is to live a life that God has intended for us. And I remember telling us that the very first step to beginning to live that life is to live a life of curious inquiry. Okay? A life, an inquisitive life. Okay? A life that is interested in knowing more, seeing more, experiencing more. My brothers and sisters, life is bigger than where we are right now. Okay? There's more to life than what is happening right now. 
There's more to life than what is happening even in this city. There's more to life than what's happening in this state. There's more to life than what's happening in this country. You must, if you want to live the full expression of the Almighty God, the Bible says, eyes have not seen, ears have not heard, nor has it entered into the heart of man. The things that God has prepared for his people. You must be curious enough and say, Lord, what is this thing that you have for me? What is this thing that you are, where is this thing that you are taking me? So when we talk about living beyond the limit, we are talking about living a life that is interested in knowing more. Interested in knowing more. A life that says, that says, I want to live more. I want to see more. I want to experience more than what is going on right now. I want to live beyond what is going on right now. I want to see beyond what my fathers have seen. I want to be able to enjoy beyond what my fathers have enjoyed. That is what living life beyond, that is what living beyond the limits is all about. It's about curious inquiry. Wanting to find out. Is it just to go to work, come back, and have children, and that's it? Is that all that life is? No. There is more. And that is the first step. A life of curious inquiry. Living beyond the limit requires curious inquiry. Trying to find out, what else, Lord? What else? We have done this. What else? We need to scale new heights. What is the next challenge? Trying to extend yourself to as much as possible. Taking you as good. Traveling as far as God will take as far as God will take you. And so this morning as we continue, it is not enough for you to have curious inquiry. It is what is, you know, for us to be able to move and live our life beyond the limits that the enemy and all the, and all the challenges around us are set before us. There is a need for us to live our life with bold aspiration. To live our life with bold aspiration. That is the second step. It's one thing for you to inquire. The next thing is for you to have this bold aspiration. To talk about and say, yes, I want to do great things. I want to live a life beyond myself. I want to do something that is bigger than myself. And this thing called bold aspiration, what is it? What is this thing that I call bold aspiration? In Genesis chapter 37, we all know the story of this young man. The Bible tells us of the story of, day of, of Joseph. One of the, the, the one of the sons of Jacob, Bible tells us that now Joseph had a dream, and he told it to his brother, and they hated him even the more. So he said to them, "Please hear this dream which I have dreamed. There were, there we were, building sheaves in the field. Then behold, my sheep stole, stole, uh, my sheep arose, and also stood upright. And indeed, your sheaves stood around and bowed down to my sheep. In other words, this guy had a bold aspiration for his life." He wasn't going to sit down there and continue to till the land just like everybody. He wasn't going to be running the sheep just like his fathers and the fathers before him were doing. He had a big plans for himself. This guy was going to go to New York City. He was going to be on the top mile, you know, if you watch the Jefferson. He was really going to live large. And as he was telling them, these guys were really pissed. Do you mean that you are going to be our Lord? Do you mean to be we are going to bow down before you? Even when he told his father, his father what, what kind of rubbish are you talking? Me, my mother, me and your mothers are going to bow down before you. But this guy had a bold aspiration for his life. And the question is, what does it mean? What is, when, when you talk about bold aspiration, what does it mean? What does it mean to live a life of bold aspiration? But bold aspiration means to have a deep a desire, a deep yearning to accomplish something bigger than yourself. Not doing things because everybody's doing the same thing. But doing something that is bigger than you. Doing something that is larger than yourself. Something that you know that only God is, can accomplish this. Joseph saw himself becoming a leader. And that's all will bow down before him. Bold aspiration is that deep desire to see a possible future. That this is what you're seeing today. You know, but you're going to see better things. I always joke when I was younger, I tell her, you better take pictures with me right now. Because the time will come where you probably sell that picture and say, I know him when it was, you know, when it was coming up. You know, we are still going to get there. We are making the journey. But the point I'm making is that there has to be a deep desire to see a possible future. Okay? David had this aspiration at the back of his mind when he was talking about the building of the temple. David wanted a temple of the house of the Almighty God. He had that deep-seated desire, that deep-seated aspiration to see the temple of God in Jerusalem one day. The question this morning is that, well, you know, why is this bold aspiration necessary for living a life beyond limits? Why do you need that bold aspiration? 
But you need that particular big dream to be able to live a life beyond limits. A bold aspiration is needed, my brothers and sisters, because aspiration creates hunger. Aspiration creates hunger in your spirits. When you desire something, there is something inside of you that says, no, I want this thing. You look at a child. They are standing and we go to circles. Everybody's having fun. And then you get to that place where you have cotton candy. Oh, my God. The eyes light up. Everything looks as, as if the whole world revolves around that cotton candy. Eventually, when you give that child a cotton candy, oh, my God. It's like they are floating on air. That thing is so good, you will just be, any other thing, mother, I say, anything that you ask that child to do at that time, he's going to do it. Just to have a taste of that thing. It creates hunger. Aspiration creates hunger. That's why you need it if you are going to move forward. Aspiration unleashes your potential because it forces you to say, what do I need to be able to get to this destination that I want to go? It forces, it unleashes the potential. The Bible says that those who hunger and thirst after righteousness, they will be filled. There has to be that hunger. And aspiration creates the hunger that releases your potential. Not only that, aspiration releases your faith because you will begin to realize that you need the faith to step into the unknown. That's why you need aspiration to live the life beyond limits. Not only that, aspiration has a way of focusing your attention. You don't look up, you don't look up and down. That girl in that, in that county fair, as they were going through the circles, if that girl is only interested in cotton candy, give them a, what do you call it, a, a, a hot dog. They say, no, that's not what I want. Give them ice cream, that's not what I want. I want this cotton candy. It focuses the attention. The same thing for you in our lives. What are we aspiring for? What are you dreaming about? What is that thing that you are trusting the Lord for? Any other thing that is offered to you, you say, no, this is not what life is. This is not what I want life. This is not what the Lord has told me. This is not what he promised me. Aspiration focuses your attention. That is why it is needed for you to be able to break the limits. Not only that, aspiration has a way of separating the non-essentials. There are things that you need to do in life that will take you where you're going. And there are things you don't have, you have no business doing. Because as soon as you get yourself involved in those things, you are not going anywhere. And so aspiration for the man or the woman who wants to live the life beyond limits, aspiration helps you to separate essentials from non-essential. Aspiration also helps you to select your associate, the people that you are going to travel with. There are some people who will help you get to where you're going. And there are some people who will never help you to get to where you're going. And that is why when you have a deep-seated aspiration, a deep-seated hunger, you want to see something in your future, it selects who you go with because it tells you, this person will help me, this person will not help me. And then finally, it has a way of disciplining your strength. You don't exert yourself into everything. Paul the Apostle said some things are beneficial to me, other things are not beneficial to me. So you conserve your energy, you focus your energy, you discipline your energy. Paul the Apostle said in 1 Corinthians 9, he said that I run, not as somebody who's just beating the air. I fight, not as somebody who's just fighting for the sake of fighting. He said, but I discipline my body so that after doing this thing, I will not be a castaway. After running this race, my aspiration will not be wasted. That's basically what he's saying. So aspiration is necessary. Your desire, your hunger in your spirit is necessary to live a life beyond limit because it has a way of strengthening your discipline. It has a way of making you to do the things that you need to do, focusing on the right thing. And these are just some of the examples. These are just some of the reasons why, you, why bold aspiration is important and necessary for living a life that is beyond limits. Now, can you imagine for a second? Imagine for a second with me where there is no aspiration, where there is no goal. Imagine an individual, a family or a community where there is no hunger, a there's no desire to accomplish anything, okay? No desire to be able to live a life that is beyond what they are living right now. They are just satisfied with where they are. Such a life, such a family, such a community where there is no drive for a better life. That life that has no aspiration will be relegated into obscurity. People will forget about you very quickly. Nobody will know you ever existed. I remember when I was in college, anytime I visit some of my friends, they already know me, I leave a particular note there. And that note was, Godwin was here. Anytime. If I come visit you and you are not at home, there is always a note that I put there, Godwin was here. Okay? Without aspiration, nobody would know you were here. 
if there's no dream, nothing you are pursuing, nobody will know that you are here. You just go and go like that. That will not be your portion in Jesus' name. So life without aspiration is a life of obscurity. Life without aspiration is a life without motivation. Because you are not pursuing anything. You are not going after anything. There is nothing that wakes you up, you know, that wakes you up in the morning to pursue. There is nothing that motivates you to go beyond the limit. There is nothing that says, okay, this is what I'm pursuing. Nothing. Okay? But when there is aspiration, there is motivation. So a life without aspiration, number one, is a life of obscurity. Number two is a life of lack of motivation. Is it, number three is a life that lacks purpose. Because there's no reason for living. There's no reason for doing what you're doing. That's why a lot of people are frustrated at work. What is the reason of this work? Yes, I'm going to need to pay my bills. Okay, fine. What else? When there is no aspiration, there is no goal, there's no desire, there is no hunger in your spirit, purpose will be lacking. And such people will live a life that is hopeless. Because they feel that they are locked up in a particular, they are locked up in a vicious circle. And if you cannot get out of that vicious circle, what happens is that there's a lot of frustration. And that is why when you meet some people, you see that they are just angry. In most cases, they are not angry at you. They are angry at themselves. That they are not moving forward. That they are not getting any result in their life. That life is just passing them by. When there is no aspiration, life has no purpose. And the life that has no purpose will always attract failure. Because people can sense it when you are not going anywhere. You know that. People can sense if you go to the mall and you just stand in a corner, you will know the people that came to buy something and the people that just got out of the house because they had nowhere to go. You can tell just looking at them. So when there is no hope, when there is no purpose, when there is no motivation, when life is lived in obscurity, life, that kind of life will always attract failure. And that's why people wonder. Some men go out and they say, I'm always attracting this kind of women. And some women say, I'm always attracting that kind of men. Look at yourself. It's a reflection of the kind of person you are. That's the kind of person you attract. But the life without aspiration is a life that attracts failure. But where there is an aspiration, when there is hunger, where there is a desire for something, where there is a deep-seated desire to, be do, to do something that is meaningful, to live a life that is bigger than yourself, all of a sudden, life takes up a new meaning. And that's why you see an individual, initially they were living a particular way, but as soon as they begin to see something, maybe they got involved in a relationship, or maybe they got a new job, or they began to see a new thing happening, you see a glow around them. They come alive all of a sudden. Okay? That tells you they are aspir there's an aspiration somewhere. There is a hunger somewhere. that they are, There's something that they are pursuing. You see a man on a mission, you can tell. And you see a man who is just wondering, you can also tell. So where there is an aspiration, life becomes meaningful. Where there is aspiration, purpose is restored. Because you are running as if you know where you are going. When there is aspiration, hope comes alive. You are not discouraged anymore. Depression begins to find it. They begin to get out of your life. You find out that you are no longer, you are no longer despondent anymore. Okay? Things begin to work out for you. Because hope comes alive. And then energy and creativity is unleashed in that particular life. Because what you find is that when you are pursuing something, all of a sudden energy begins to come. You begin to find that you can now walk longer. You can now do things, you know, that ordinarily you will not do. Because you are pursuing something. You are looking for a particular result. You are trying to get to a particular place. So it releases energy. It releases creativity. And then you begin to see that the future that you are looking for, that future becomes possible. It becomes visible for you. What other people normally thought that was impossible, all of a sudden becomes possible in your life. Because you can see these things. You can see the reality of this thing. Because there is an aspiration. Now there are those who say that because we are Christians, okay? Because we are Christian, we are not supposed to have aspiration. We are not supposed to hunger for something big. That if you hunger for something big, you are carnal. Because if you hunger for something big, you know, you are, you are not going to be able to please the Lord. They say that dreaming big is pride. And that is of the devil. Christians are not supposed to be prideful. As such, they are not supposed to aspire to be something big. But the question that I always find, you know, that I find interesting is that the Bible tells us in Genesis 1. If you read from verse number 26, the Bible tells us that then God said, 
Let us make man in our own image, according to our own likeness. Let them have dominion over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air, over the cattle, over all, uh, uh, all over the earth, and over every creeping thing that creeps upon the earth. Verse number 27, so God created man in his own image, in the image of God created in him, male and female, he created them. Now look at verse 28. The Bible says, then God blessed them. Huh? And God said to them, be fruitful and multiply and fill the earth and subdue it and have dominion over the fish and over the, uh, over the fish of the sea, over the birds of the air and over every living thing that moves upon the air. Now, please think about it for a second. Think about it for a second. If God created us hmm, to be fruitful, to multiply and to have dominion, why in the world would it be a sin to desire for fruitfulness? Why will it be a sin for you to desire increase? Why will it be a sin for you to desire dominion in your area of influence? If God created us to be fruitful, to multiply, and to have dominion, why in the world would anyone think that desiring something good is a sin? Why? Why is it that aspiring for greater height? Why will it be against the will of God if God created us to be fruitful, to multiply, and to have dominion? If you think about it, you will begin to wonder. The question is, why does the church always condemn human aspiration? Why do we condemn people who are always working to better themselves? Why? Why does the church condemn people who are desiring greater heights? Let me suggest to you that the church does all that because we have believed a lie. We have believed a lie. The Bible says where there is no vision, the people perish. We have believed a lie of the devil that, the, 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 that money is the root of all evil. But if you read the scripture very well, it did not say money is the root of all evil. If money is the root of evil, the Bible says that he gives you power to make wealth. That means God is shooting himself on the foot. Okay? But because we have believed the lie, we do not understand what the Bible is saying. Okay? Many have been brought into that particular belief system and in the, the, that indoctrinate people against aspiring for material success. It has indoctrinated people into, you know, into a, uh, not aspiring to achievement and to prosperity. They have been convinced that money is the root of all evil. But the Bible says the love of money, which is different from the possession of money, is the root of all evil. How do you think you can sit here? You think the landlord, as much as what is going on right now, you think the landlord will take, will accept, God bless you. At the end of the month, I'll say, landlord, Mr. Landlord, thank you very much for giving us your appointment. God bless you. The guy will say, amen. Where is my check? They used to say something back at home. They say money is the vehicle of the gospel. Okay? When you don't get money, you're going to be limited. We are operating on several platforms. For the past three years, we have been on the radio. We are online. Our videos are going on. We have, uh, what do you call it? We have a, a Spotify channel. We have, a, 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 what do you call it, a podcast that is being broadcast as far as India. How do you think those things are happening? Eh? It takes money to run this business. So the whole idea that aspiration is evil is because we have believed a lie. Number two, the way the church keep believing that aspiration is evil is because we have flawed reasoning. Flawed reasoning. Jesus Christ said, if you being evil know how to give good gifts to your children, you think God will now say, okay, I don't, I don't want you to be evil, so I'll take the good gift from you. I mean, God is not crazy. Eh? I know there's legalized pot, but God is not smoking pot. So please understand, there's, no, there's a problem here. The idea is that people have believed the lie and their thinking is faulty. That's why we are talking about, that's why we, many of us see these things as evil. And then finally, many have, many view bold aspiration with suspicion because they have done what is called a false equivalence. What I mean by false equivalence is this. They have equated penury with piety. The poorer you are, the holier you become. That is the thinking of some Christians. They have increased, they have equated suffering <laughs> with favor with the Almighty God. The more you suffer, the more God will like you. That God must be really messed up. Not only that, they have, they have, they have equated burden. When you carry your burden, carry your cross, they say that is humility. No! No! 
The enemy is punishing, cheating, and stealing from us, and we think that is righteousness. So because of false equivalence, because of false thinking, and because we have believed a lie, many of us do not, we have a negative view of bold aspiration. We have a negative view of people who are pursuing to better themselves. And please understand, any desire that you have, the desire for riches, the desire for wealth, the desire for other things that is supported, that is, that, is, that is done because of greed, because of lust, and because of jealousy, is destructive and is counterproductive. That is not what we're talking about here. When you pursue things just because you want to have them, or because you want to be better than your brother or better than your sister, because you want to, you want to receive the praise of man, when you pursue things for the wrong reason, those things are destructive. Okay? And all the Bible always warns against those things. The Bible warns against those things. The Bible tells us that those things are dangerous. But when we focus on the negative, we do not. When as a church we focus on the negative aspect of aspiration, what you find is that we no longer stretch ourselves. We abandon the search for good things. I mean, you're happy. Why should you look for a new job? You're happy. Why should you do something better? When we are happy with mediocrity, we stop searching for a better life. When we are happy, when we believe this uh, nonsense about that uh, 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 failure, is, uh, failure is, uh, is, is spirituality, we stop the pursuit of excellence. When you believe these things, when you believe, when you believe that it's a sin for you to better yourself, you settle for mediocrity. God understand. God does not want you to be this. And that is why you go, most of the churches that you, you, you go to church, that's where you have one of the worst practices. Excellence is not, you know, it's not, it's not, it's not, a, it's not something that we aspire for. Because we think, oh, God understands. God is not a God of mediocrity. Look at the things that he created. Everything he created were beautiful. That tells you, gave it a lot of time. And God is a God of excellence. You look at the things, the way he designed those, you know that he must have really sat down and did some serious thinking. He didn't do it in a hurry. Yes, he created it in a day, but he didn't do it. Okay, let's just put it here. Let's just put it here. And that's why it goes under my skin when certain things don't work right. Because it's a God of excellence. I tell people you find excellence at the point of intersection. But that's a story for another day. When we do not aspire to get better, we settle for mediocrity. And not only that, we blame others for our own failures. It is the devil. And I keep saying it, the devil is going to deny a lot of things. Say, so this one, are you doing? You don't want to do anything. That's why you are the way you are. It's not me. But when we do not aspire, when we are focusing on negative aspiration, we begin to blame the devil, begin to blame family member, begin to blame the boss. You blame the white man. You blame the economy. We blame all sorts of things for our own failure. When we refuse to aspire for something better. But when our desires and aspirations are fired up and they are aligned with the will of God, God works through us to bring his plan and his purpose to pass and extend his reach through us. We become the conduit of God's blessings. And so if you are interested in living a life beyond limits, if, 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 if we are interested in making sure that we get to the height where God wants to take us, it is not enough for you to ask the question. It is not enough for you to have a, a curious inquiry about of what, of what is possible. If you are interested in living a life beyond limits, we must have bold aspiration. A hunger in your spirit to get better. Okay? There has to be something inside of you that says, Lord, I want something better. And that's what Jesus was saying. Matthew chapter 6, verse 33, the Bible tells us, He said, But seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added unto us. In other words, Jesus is saying, Our life, if we, if you, if we want to aspire, to be able to get to where we are going. If we want to begin to see God move in our behalf and live the life that God has planned for us, our life, you know, our aspiration must start with knowing what God's plan is for your life. Where God, where does God want to take you? His plan for you is different from his plan for me. And that is why you do not try to conform yourself to the image of another person. So if you want to live a life beyond limit, the first thing you need to do is know God's plan for your life. So seek ye first the kingdom of God. You know what God has planned for you. Number two, you need to align yourself with that plan of God. Stay where God wants you to stay. Begin to position yourself so that you are properly aligned with the, with the plan of God for you. He says, seek ye first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. Righteousness means proper alignment. That's what it means. 
So seek that particular plan of God for your life. Align yourself properly to it, and then begin to see, you know, and then and then begin to engage that particular plan. Begin to pursue it. God says, "This is what I want you to do." Begin to pursue that thing. God said, "This direction I want you to go." Begin to go in that direction. Engage God's plan for your life, and then dedicate yourself to that particular plan. Don't move to the right. Don't move to the left. Just focus on what God has called you to do. Many of us get into trouble because we are looking at what our neighbor is doing. We are, very, we are, so, we are getting into trouble because you want to be like the Joneses. You want to be like the other person. You want to do things like the other people. And God is saying, my plan for you is different, my friend. Focus on where I am taking you. Focus on the things that I want you to go. There are examples in scriptures. You remember this guy called John the Baptist. The Bible says that the, Lord, the call of God upon his life was very simple. When you see Jesus, say, this is the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world. Follow him. Once you do that, your ministry is, for, your ministry is done. John did it. It was fine. Then John saw Herod and Herodias doing kurukere, kurukere, and he began to say, ah, it's not good, it's not good. That's what got him into trouble. They had to send him into jail and chop off his head. He went away from what God sent him. Okay? The same thing with Paul the Apostle. God told him, I'm sending you to the Gentiles. Paul said, no, I want to go to the Jews. God said, you go suffer. He said, yes, I will suffer. I'm ready to die. Okay, go, go. That's what you want to do? Go ahead. The point I'm trying to make is this. When you already know the plan of God for your life, when you align yourself to the plan of God, when you engage that plan, dedicate yourself to that plan. Don't jump from one thing to the other. Don't jump from one thing to the other. And that is why a lot of us are not making progress. Because we are not staying long enough to see God move on our behalf. David's aspiration was to build a temple for the Almighty God. And it started by knowing that and pursuing God's mind concerning his dwelling place. And the question this morning that I have for you and that I have for myself is that, are we aspiring to the best that God has for us? Are you aspiring for it? Do you even know the God's best for you? And if we know it, are we aspiring ourselves? Are we pursuing that aspiration? Are we dedicating ourselves onto that particular thing? Are we making sure that we do not move to the right or to the left? Are we making sure that we are not distracted by the noise of this particular world? Are you hungry for the best that God has in store for you? And if you are hungry for you, are you pursuing it with, your, with all that God has given unto you? Let's bow our heads as we talk to the Almighty God.